Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of TC Talk, back today with another video. And in today's video, we're going to be doing episode three of our How to Katsu series. And this one is going to be about deck building. Now, this specifically could be like four or five videos if we want to, but I'm trying to approach it from someone who's trying to get into Katsu or someone who maybe has gotten into Katsu but is trying to get a little bit better at it, a little bit more honed in. So that's what this is for. Later on in the series, because I'm, I'm going to try, this is like a 10 part series or more as much as I can think of stuff we'll get into really nuanced stuff but really this is to get you on the right track so that your first deck is very tuned or at least tuned enough to where you have something to work with so if you're new to the channel welcome thank you so much for joining if you're a long-standing member thank you so much for your continued support everyone feel free to check out the patreon and the discord down below if you so choose for access to an amazing community and some added channel benefits so when it came to deck building, we're going to be doing a couple different videos for sure. We're going to be doing this video, which is like the principles of Katsu deck building. Then I'm going to do a video talking about different Katsu decks in general. So the Tiger Katsu deck, uh, the Bonds of Ancestry based deck, the full like Surging Line based deck. I'll do a, a Turtle Katsu like control deck. And then I'll do what I have coined the term of Breakpoint Katsu, which is just like really high value attack, similar to like an Ira play style that also has some combo stuff. So we're going to do videos on those as well. But for this one, I want to get you started. Like if you're building your first Katsu deck, no matter what your your deck profile is or what your deck archetype is, these are the principles you need to follow in Katsu in order to have a consistent and good deck. Okay? So there's five here, very simple, and I want to kind of just go over them with you all and, and get you all thoughts on them. If you're, if you're a long-standing Katsu player, let me know any others. Put some more down in the comments below, and we'll talk about it so we can get some new players on the right track. So first one, and there's, these are in no particular order of importance, just ones as I thought in my head. First one is your mana base, your resources, right? Whether you're new to Flesh and Blood, new to TCGs, whatever, the way Flesh and Blood works is typically you have blue cards that are mainly used for pitch, right? They can be used for other stuff, but mainly used for resources. And how many blues do you have in a Katsu deck? Now, it, it, it depends heavily on your build, right? The hyper, hyper, hyper aggro builds with a lot of zero cost, uh, especially back in like the Monarch time frame when you were running stuff like Scar for a Scar, Ravenous Rabble, like all these like super zero cost cards. You, those Katsu decks have around 12 blues in them. Um, back before Belittle was banned, it could even go lower. But for typically the hyper aggro decks have around 12 blues. In the Bonds of Ancestry decks, even the aggro versions, or I guess the more competitive decks right now in Katsu, typically have around 14 to 16 blues, I would say, maybe as high as 17. I personally have 17. It all depends on what your meta is. But typically, I'd say 15 is like the average number for blues. And then with your hyper control list or even your hyper mid-range list that are not looking to do anything crazy until they hit their big combo turn, those will have 18 blues because they're always wanting to Kadachi and get value. So typically, if you're a hyper, hyper aggro list, you just want to go face the whole time and you're not worried about cost, then and you have a lot of zero cost cards, uh, zero cost attacks, you can, you can get away with 12 to 13 blues. Although, be careful. Um, I ran a 12 to 13 blue list for a while, and it wasn't too bad. But it, you have to definitely deal with when you get the bad hands. Running um, equipment like Heart and Cross Strap for your Surging Strikes for your chest piece is really, really good as well to help uh, mediate, mediate when you don't have that blue to pay for that Surging Strike. So that's number one for your mana base. Number two, have around 35 to 40 zero-cost cards in your deck. I would never go below 35, in my opinion. Um, Katsu's ability reads, the first time an attack action card hits, you may discard a card with cost zero and then go get a card with combo, banish it, and play it this turn. So if you play Surging Strike and you're wanting to go get that Whelming Gust Wave, or you're playing Leg Tap and you're wanting to go get that Rise and Thrust to combo into the next card, you need to discard a zero cost. So if you don't have a lot of zero costs in your deck, you're going to hurt your consistency. Now, people will argue this point. The reason I say don't have less than 35 is you want the flexibility of Katsu, right? One of Katsu's biggest strengths now with the Bonds of Ancestry line is this consistency. You need to be able to discard cards to go get that full line, right? If you can't discard a card, it's a super feels bad. Even card uh, uh, hands that aren't too bad. Like if you have a hand like Surging Strike, um, Razor Reflex, Spinning Wheel Kick, and um, McGinchy Release, right? So you have the Surging Strike and you have the McGinchy Release, but you can't go get that Whelming Gust Wave because you have no way of discarding a zero-cost card. Now, I'm not saying you can't have non-zero-cost in your deck. Don't just have all zero-cost in your deck. 
But you need when you make your full deck, you need to have, it, in my opinion, at least 35 zero cost to be safe. I've seen people go as low as 32 in competitive lists. However, most competitive Katsu players that are performing well is around 35 to 40, sometimes even more uh, zero cost cards. So keep that in mind. Number three, limit to no more than 13 non-attack cards. Now, I don't mean non-attack action cards. I mean any card that is not an attack. Do not have more than 13 in your list unless you are a hypro control list. If you are an aggro or mid-range katsu, if once you get above that 13 number, which is basically one per hand or a little bit under one per hand, you start to clog your hand up, right? Even a good card like Art of War. If you draw a blue, a razor reflex, uh, Art of War, and an attack, you basically have to discard your last attack to to your only attack to play Art of War, which you don't want to do. It really clogs up your hand. If you look at my list, which we'll talk about here in a second, I have three, in, not in a second, but in a future video, I have three Ancestral Empowerments. I have uh, three Flick Flax. I have two Razor Reflexes. That makes eight. Um, I have two Conceal Blades. That makes 10. And then I actually have three Blue Flick Flax just for a little bit more defensive value. So I have 13 non-attack cards. I would not go above that. I think if you can keep it below that number, then you're in good shape. Most non-attacks in Katsu now are Ancestral Empowerment, Flick Flack, Razor Reflex, uh, Art of War, and Conceal Blade are kind of the, the typical ones. And then you'll see stuff like also um, Lunging Press as well. So trying to go below uh, above that. I got that original uh, thought process from Hayden Dale um, on Arsenal Pass, but this was way back in the Monarch meta, so maybe he might have a different opinion today. But since I got, took that piece of advice from him, it's never gone back and uh, on one of his videos, and it's worked out really well for me. Number four, build around a combo line or a game plan. The power of Katsu is in his consistency of what he's trying to do. Whether you say, I want to build a Tiger Katsu list, or whether you say, I want to have, have a hyper control list, or you might say, I want to be like typical competitive list, and I want to do a Bonds of Ancestry list. You can need... you. I, I, what is the thing I see with a lot of new players in Katsu is they have a lot of different combo lines in their deck, which is fine. That's You want to have a little bit of diversity. However, if you're too all over the place, then you have inconsistencies in your ability to combo. If Katsu is not comboing, he's not getting the value that he normally wants to get that makes him a competitive deck. So like, if you look at my current competitive list, which we'll look at in a later video, and I, I run a Bonds of Ancestry-based list, I out of the 60 cards in my main deck... I have 4, 7, 10, um, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, 24, 27, 30. 30 out of 60 of my cards are based around one combo line or play into one combo line in one way or another. Half of my deck. And that really allows you to basically potentially draw into that combo almost every single turn or close to it, which allows you to have consistent damage and consistent threats. If you decide you want to do the Tiger Katsu list, you know, with Tiger Swipe and Crouching Tigers, that's great. Don't be putting in crazy stuff. I see some people try to do like the Surging Strike line with Crouching Tigers. If you want to do that and if you enjoy it, sure. But if you want to be more competitive and more consistent, don't do that. Don't mix two different, a bunch of different like thought processes. Pick a combo line, pick a game plan, and then build your entire deck around that one game plan. I promise you'll have a lot more consistent of a time. And then number five, build a focused sideboard. This is a very nuanced thing, and I want to do a sideboard. I'm going to do a sideboard video as a, as a whole. Sideboarding is really hard to talk about in a series like this because it changes from meta to meta, right? What my sideboard is right now currently is completely different than what it was in the Monarch meta. It's completely different than what it was in the Everfest meta, and so on and so forth. So... You need to change based off the meta. However, Katsu is a very focused deck, right? There are some decks in the game that can have a lot of toolbox stuff in their sideboard. Like Azalea is a, is a hero I play. She can have a lot of toolbox stuff that naturally just fits into her archetype. Katsu, it's hard to do that. It's hard to fit just a bunch of natural different toolbox stuff into his deck. So... Make sure your sideboard is... I would just tech it for like one or two matchups. Like right now, in my sideboard, I have Command and Conquerors because Ranger, really good for that. I have Reinforced Line and Sync Belows for Guardian. And then I have stuff like Bonds of Ancestry and Mask of Pouncing Links for Guardian as well. Basically, 80% of my sideboard is teched for Ranger and Guardian, which are my two hardest matchups. And then I have like one card in there, Blazing Yori, for the Mirror and for Ninja. 
now some sideboards will be like 15, 20 deep, right? There are some decks where they have like, since you have to have a minimum of a 60 card main deck in this game, some decks will have like 48, 45 cards, maybe 51 in their main board, and then they side in like 9 to 12 cards. Most of the time with Katsu and Ninjas in general, you're going to have a 60 card main deck, and then you're going to be subbing things out and subbing things in uh, as appropriate. Another thing that's for deck building, and we'll kind of talk about this in a later video, I just want to touch on really fast as it popped in my head. Whatever you side into your deck from your sideboard, you need to side out the same type of card. So let's say, for example, you have three sink belows in your sideboard that are defense reactions, and you want to side them in against a guardian, and you want to take three cards out. Do not take out three attacks. If you take out three attacks for three cards that aren't an attack, then that goes against our principle number three, which is don't have more than 13 non-attacks in your, in, your, in your deck. You want to side them out for something that uh, isn't an attack. So if you side in three sink belows, maybe take out one razor and two ancestral empowerments. Or take out both of your razors if you have two of them and one ancestral empowerment. Side out side in what you side out, right? So keep that in mind as you build your deck. Uh, but these are five core principles. Whenever you're building your first deck, the video tomorrow will go over different decks and I'll, and I'll point out these principles to you as we're talking about them so you can get an idea of like the actual practical application of what it is I'm saying. But if you're out there right now and you're building your first deck, if you follow these five principles, I promise no matter what katsu you pick, the deck will at least be remotely consistent, right? Um, and that's kind of like your step one because a lot of Katsu players, I think, get discouraged because they don't make a consistent deck, and the issue when you don't make a consistent deck is then the deck feels bad, and you feel like the deck sucks, and it's not doing what you want it to do, but really it's just the deck wasn't built in a consistent manner. If, the, if Katsu's built consistently, he will execute his game plan very, very easily, so keep that in mind. But yeah, hopefully you all enjoyed this. If you did, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. If not, it's totally fine. Go into our Flesh Bug Creator. Leave a like, comment, subscribe on their stuff so we can get more people seeing this game. Hope you all are enjoying this, this series and this content. Like I said, I already have like 10 plus episodes in the shoot, and I'm going to be making even more as I think of it and just make a huge How to Katsu series for people as they go along their Katsu journey. Um, and, yeah, hopefully you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time on TC Talk. Thank you all so much.